Okay, so let's get started. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Ishan Persine. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as we discover that the Asian Pacific American community is the fastest growing demographic in Central Texas. So they also represent $1 trillion in buying power in the US economy. So today in this virtual workshop, you will be learning from our industrial experts um, to learn about the cultural traits of the community and how to build your uh, consumer loyalty with them. Um, in this webinar, this webinar is also in partnership and co-hosted by the City of Austin's Economic Development Department. Um, I would also like to thank our corporate partner um, for supporting the Chamber's programming. Um, please know that the following presentation will not be distributed, but the webinar will be recorded. At the end of the presentation, we will also leave some Q&A. So uh, please type down your questions in the chat box below. Um, Marina, would you like me to um, hand over to you so that you can introduce our speakers? Absolutely. Thank you, Marina. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marina Bargava. I'm the CEO of the Asian Chamber. So welcome. I'm really, really excited to be hosting this webinar. Um, we, you know, let's go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to introduce our speakers. We are so, I am so excited. I've been waiting for this for a long time. And frankly, I have to like thank COVID-19 for allowing this to happen because everybody is doing things virtually. Um, so we have two amazing speakers. Um, Mariko Carpenter, you can see she's the VP of Strategic Community Alliances with Nielsen. And Nielsen, if you don't know, is the world's largest consumer research company. Um, more than 40,000 associates across 106 countries. Um, prior to joining Nielsen, Marika was the consumer marketing lead at Condé Nast, and she was responsible for driving consumer revenue across all channels of business for three iconic brands, GQ, Bon Appetit, and Golf Digest. Marika serves as a thought leader on U.S. multicultural consumer insights with focus on Asian Pacific Americans. And as Yishan mentioned, we are the fastest growing um, demographic in the country, in Texas, in Central um, Texas as well, and the fastest growing consumer segment. So we're really excited to have you, Mariko. Um, and then Bill Amada, okay. So when I first started at the chamber, I get this email from this gentleman and he's talking about National ACE and asking if we would consider being an um, MOU partner and I immediately um, responded to the email and guess what he calls me and I talked to this gentleman and it's really you know it's been a wonderful journey our partnership with um, National Ace which Marco is on the board as well so Bill is the founder of IW group IW group is a full-service communication advertising and marketing agency they specialize in multicultural and multi-generational markets and for three decades Bill and his team has served some of the top global brands. Folks like, if I'm gonna just list a few that you all recognize. Coca-Cola, Lexus, McDonald's, Netflix, Walmart, Walt Disney, Warner Brothers, many, many others. And Bill's areas of expertise include community relations, crisis communications, cultural training, and media training. So we're really excited to have these two wonderful speakers with us. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mariko and she's going to share her screen and um, give us a presentation about what Nielsen has found out about us. Great. Thank you so much for that inter uh, introduction, Marina. Uh, let me make sure I can get myself here. Here we go. Let's see. Okay. Oh, hold on. I'm not in the beginning. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mariko Carpenter. Thank you so much for the introduction and really happy Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month. Uh, we're already midway through the, the Heritage Month, and but um, I hope that I'm so glad that you can join us today for, for this webinar. I really have to take note of all the 
sponsors of the Austin Chamber. That's really, uh, it's always the corporate sponsors who really may allow us, uh, our community to come together in this way. So uh, really thank you for, for, for them as well. Uh, I have a lot to cover here. I'm really honored to be here to share with you some of some highlights from the Asian American uh, Consumer Report. As Marina said, we are a research company. We measure what consumers are doing, um, what they're buying, where they're buying, what they're watching. And um, really, uh, I think the COVID-19 showed us that it's so important for brands to really connect with customers uh, because you know we live in a world where you can have the best product, it could be the best price, um, but really if you don't have that connection with your customers, it's really, uh, you, it's hard for you to stay relevant and uh, grow. So uh, I hope that this will be insightful in terms of understanding who we are as Asian American consumers, but also as a community. So I thought, you know, I would start here, right, asking this question of why, why do Asian Americans matter to marketers now, to all of you who are uh, running your own business? Uh, and really, there's one big, big factor, which is that we do represent the fastest growing ethnic and racial group. 22 million uh, in population, and that's a growth of 90% since year 2000. So, um, and with that growth in population is also the growth of our consumer spending power, $1.15 trillion. Uh, and really what's so, in, what's so um, relevant here is again, the growth, right? So we've grown 314% since year 2000, and we're actually projected to grow another 38% in the next five years. So uh, for anybody who is thinking about, uh, a, you know, a growth market, well, first of all, everyone's thinking about sort of the recovery st strategy post-COVID, but, um, and, and in all those strategies where you are thinking about the future, Asian Americans are a group that you really cannot afford to, um, afford to miss uh, going forward. So, you know, when we talk about this growth, it's really two groups of people that are fueling this growth in our community. The first are the immigrants. Um, India and China surpassed Mexico as, in source, as the number one and two sources of immigrants. Uh, so, you know, there's all these conversations about immigration in the community. And a lot of times the emphasis is on Mexico, but really we have the largest uh, immigrant population. And, um, you know, within that, there is a good portion of of Asian Americans who are coming to this country in what we call the H-1B visa. And these are temporary visas that governments issue, the government issues um, uh, for highly skilled uh, individuals to come to this country in a specific role. And a lot of that is actually um, uh, uh, issued by tech companies. So you know, uh, whether it's Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, and given that this is Austin, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, tech folks out there, so you might be very familiar with the H-1B uh, visa, but 19% of Asian American uh, immigrants who arrive in this country are earning more than 75,000, and that is because a lot, of, a lot of them come here on a temporary visa and in the STEM field. Another, er, another part of immigrant that we, we shouldn't discount are the, uh, the, the big population of students who come to this country from India and China, uh, particularly for higher ed. Uh, you know, when we look at Asians that are coming to this country uh, to study, almost half of them, 42% of them are going into uh, graduate school. So we're talking about individuals who are coming here already educated and really just honing their, their, you know, their specialty when they come to this country. And really, you know, um, it's, I always love to remind everybody that when you think about Fortune 500 companies in this, in, uh, companies in this country, almost half of them were founded by immigrants, right? Immigrants, whether, whether they're first generation or second generation. So really, um, it is, an, it is a, a group that is contributing to the health of the economy of this country, but also the, uh, the advancement of, of technology and everything else uh, that we do here. 
And the, so then switching over to the right side, uh, the other group that's really fueling this growth for Asian Americans are the US born. 86% of Asian Americans under the age of 18 was born, were born here in the United States. And so different from their immigrant parents and may perhaps their immigrant grandparents as well, this is a group that really, uh, you know, uh, understands the responsibility and the privileges that come with being an Asian American. So they're the ones who are really breaking the barrier when it comes to representation and really raising the bar in a lot of different fields. Then, it, so you're seeing more it, more people going into public office, see more Asians in uh, entertainment, you see more Asians uh, in fashion industry, and that's really because you know if you think about what, what for immigrants who just arrived into this country, it's really there's a lot of um, obstacles to get into some of these industries, right? So it gets very very limiting in terms of what it is that an, a recent immigrant could actually do uh, to make money because you don't if you don't know the laws of this country it's very hard to be a lawyer it's hard to go into acting if you don't know anybody in Hollywood so um, those were some of the obstacles that immigrant immigrants face but these US born they they're they're creating their network and really diversifying the uh, professions that they're going into and really showcasing our uh, our Asian American representation and so, you know, thinking through all this sort of data, what it shows is that we are uh, a community that's really evolving. It's evolving because we, as we get more and more uh, U.S. born Asian Americans into the mix, into the pie, uh, the bigger piece, bigger piece of the pie, we are really seeing what we are calling the rise in Asian American consciousness. Right? Um, when we were at one point a disparate groups of immigrants, uh, that we were very much, uh, you know, identified as part of our our heritage. So I know I growing up, I was always I identified as being a Japanese American. Um, and never consider myself as an Asian American because for the big part, like I didn't know what that, that meant. Where that has really, really changed. Um, we have now the strong cultural identity of what it means to be Asian American. And um, this picture that you see here on the screen is a, a story that ran in the New York Times just last month. And I thought it really is a good representation of what this Asian American consciousness is like. It, it means uh, this was a story where uh, they talked about these Asian and Asian American designers that are really impacting the fashion industry. And, uh, you know, just even being in the front page of the New York Times and then to have all of these spaces of different Asian background to be in one place and be a collaborative and, uh, you know, collective voice is something that's new to our community and one that we're really, really embracing. Uh, you know, I, they're the change makers, right? Uh, so, so for in the fashion industry, like we're not we're no longer the invisible or the, or, or the Asians that are over here. We are actually the change makers that are really making an influence in the industry. And that to me is a representation of where we are today. And so before I get into sort of like the, the marketing and where, where we're, we're really, uh, where we've really come to for, I just wanted to give you a, just a real broad um, background of our demographics, right? So um, Asian American, as I, in aggregate, we are the highest income. We earn the highest income in an individual level as well as the household level compared to non-Hispanic whites and really compared to the average total US. Uh, again, that has to do with, uh, you know, a lot of 23% of Asians go into the STEM field. And we know that STEM is also uh, a one where there is there is the highest uh, highest income it's also you know in a household level 47 percent of asian american households that have married couples have dual income so we are a family there are a lot of families where both parents are working um, but it's really also important to note that we are a group that has the highest disparity when it comes to wealth uh, so you have refugee uh communities that are like the mongs uh that are coming into the united states and they live under uh, under the poverty line. We have, I know I'm from New York City and um, we have one in four Asian American
Americans in New York City are living under the poverty line. So, uh, you know, when we hear of talks about model minority, my model minority, it is a myth. Uh, when you think about all the different communities that are represented in Asian American, but in aggregate, we certainly do have the average uh, highest income. And again, that is driven by education. You have 44% who have had higher education. And um, we're a group that is young, 34.6 versus 43.6. This is really, really critical. Um, it's critical in a lot of ways because if you think about younger age demographic, at least certainly at 34, this is a group that is about to make big decisions. You know, they're the ones who are sort of on the rise on the, on the, on, in their profession. They're also the ones who are just having children. They're buying their house. Um, they're buying their second car. So it's really, really a, a group that is about to start a, a, their, you know, uh, a lot of spending a lot of money, earning a lot of money, but also spending a lot of money because I have two kids and I know they, there's a lot of money that goes out. <laughs> um, and then, you know, so we have families with more, more uh, uh, under the age of 35. And then their household is bigger, right? 2.9 versus 2.3 because we are a lot of households with children. Um, but we're also uh, represent a household with a, uh, with a bigger, that are, that's bigger, multi-generational. And this is really important for people and when you come, when it comes to marketing strategy and messaging, um, this is a group that, you know, for, for whom like uh, value is really important because you have more people living in the house. More people in the house means more toilet paper, better Wi-Fi. Um, so I'll, I'll, this is a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of implications when it comes to sort of services and products and how you package it. We love Costco um, for this reason. I think the other part of it is this multi-generation uh, really speaks to the influence that there is, that exists between within the family. So you always have to think about the dinner table. There's gonna be grandma and then there's gonna be the grandkids and how what that conversation looks like, right? Um, and then also just thinking about who's buying, who's doing the buying. So when you're, if you're a marketer and you have something that you really want to appeal to the senior citizen, uh, you also have to think about the, the middle generation because they're the ones who are probably at the store buying for their parents. Uh, so all of this really, really, uh, uh, you know, it needs to ta be taken into consideration from a marketing standpoint. And then, you know, in terms of diversity, we are a very diverse group. Uh, six heritages actually, they'll make up 84% of uh, Asian American community. Um, and really three of them are majority, at, you know, Chinese, Indian, Filipino make the biggest pieces uh, of the pie. And uh, this information is readily available through census where, you know, you really could uh, look at your customer space and see what type of um, ethnicity amongst the Asian American community is really penetrated in your in your respective markets. And um, so we, as I mentioned, we do a lot, we do, we present this, um, we put this rich body of work together every year uh, and we release it on Heritage Fund uh, on Asian American consumers. And we really hone in on areas that are important to marketers uh, where Asians are really making a difference and having a big influence. And one of the place, one of the trends that we really focus on this year is this, uh, you know, our digital connectivity and how what the role that we're playing in this world of streaming, right? Um, so many, so there's so much proliferation of content today. Uh, you know, I think in, in the Nielsen report, we actually reported there were 646,000 unique content uh, that is uh, available through streaming. So uh, with that, you can just imagine the, you know, the streaming war that's happening, right? Um, and I feel like every, every month we see a new platform, whether it's Digital Plus or the Peacock or whatever. Um, and so Asian Americans are actually uh, ca capturing the attention of the marketers because we are already very digitally, uh, we have a high propensity to be digitally connected. And so we're leading the, the, the pack when it comes to being cord cutters. Uh, you know, um, we prefer digital connection to, to view our, our uh, to, to view 
uh, TV content. So you have 17% who are on broadband only, so they don't go to cable, but they're streaming uh, streaming TV, TV content. And then you have Asian Americans that are also trying new platforms like Sling, like Hulu Live, Live Plus, like YouTube TV, who are using these new platforms to access live TV, uh, live TV. So this is a trend that we're seeing across the board, but it's the Asian Americans that are really sort of leading the way. And so marketers like to see us as, so, uh, uh, you know, see through our behavior, they sort of can see where the path will be for the general market. And so uh, it's no surprise also that, you know, we own all these technology and we're also streamers. 82% of Asian American households uh, have at least one streaming device, uh, a subscribe to one streaming service uh, versus 72% of the total population. And, um, and, you know, when I look at Netflix top shows that Asian Americans are watching, it's very similar to what everybody else is watching. So Asian American Americans love, also love Tiger King. We love Ozark. We love Love is Blind. Um, but where we start to see a big difference is in our support for Asian American content, right? Um, we, a lot of these streaming platforms have done a really good job of delivering and bringing value to Asian American viewers by putting, by producing content that have Asian representation, that have Asian Americans behind the scenes. Um, and also, you know, so, so the, just even these as an example, especially when it comes to comedy, stand up, Ali Wong, Ken Jeong, like, um, you know, comedy is, is really hits you, you know, through your, your heritage. And so um, all the comedy specials of, of Asian American comedians are rank really high amongst Asians. Uh, and especially Ronnie Chang, actually, he ranked as one of the top 10. He was, so he was up there with the Tiger King, with Ozark, um, uh, among the Asian American viewers. And so this is, uh, and, you know, and this is kind of, it, it, it's important because it really signals also to the big studios, right? To say that, hey, you know, diverse uh, audiences are really looking for diverse content. And, you know, I know I'm really, and Netflix has K-drama. I don't know if we have K-drama fans out there, um, but I actually watch a reality show from Japan called Terrace House. Uh, and I probably, it's probably not good for me to admit that, but, but I love it. I love it that I can watch that. And then I can watch, you know, uh, Queer Eye with my 13 year old daughter. But, but, but this, this is something that uh, the networks are paying attention to. Another, you know, another part uh, in this streaming war is this, uh, you know, for, for content creators and advertiser is like looking for, for viewers that really, um, have high engagement, right? And so uh, we find that Asian Americans, you know, we have more devices. And so we actually spend more time on social than, than the average. Um, and we are doing that while we're watching shows as well. And so uh, Nielsen has, you know, social content ratings, which actually rates TV content as it relates to social media chatter. Right. Um, and so Patriot, for instance, is 4.7 times more social than other Netflix series. So that means that there are more there is more conversations about Patriot on social than other net, net, uh, other Netflix uh, series. Warrior uh, is number one social content on Cinemax. And then uh, our beloved, you know, Aquafina is Nora from Queens on Comedy Central uh, because, because there, definitely there are a lot of you are supporting uh, this show. Aquafina ranks as number two. BD Wong, who plays her dad, ranks number five as the most social uh, talent rank for uh, Comedy Central. And in the context of streaming wars, this is so important because um, of discoverability, right, for, for, for your content. So as an example, when you have an Asian American viewer watching and they're tweeting about Patriot, 
what it does is it raises the video popularity score of Patriot, right? Um, there is these, uh, you know, Nielsen has Grace Note video popularity score, but there's other scoring, which actually measures all these different types of uh, variables, including social engagement. And that score then feeds the algorithm that's used to do, to identify recommended shows. And you know, for every, everyone who's gone on to Netflix or any other streaming, the recommendation is how you learn about new shows, right? Those are the ones that you end up watching. So uh, this is why for um, content creators and really advertisers, they look for viewers like Asian Americans because they know that they are socially engaged. And what that means is that it, it will help to actually grow the audience for that content. We also talk about talking about content. We talk about Asian Americans really leaning into the news, you know, um, and this is really an important part of our, you know, understanding our community because, uh, you know, if for somebody who engage who engages in the news, really means that that person sees themselves as part of the community, right? Um, if you didn't really care about the community, you really wouldn't be turning into the news, uh, and it really so it speaks that we, it speaks to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Asian Americans as being engaged in what's happening, whether it's political, whether it's lo local, it shows that we are patriot, uh, you know, it shows our patriotism, right? We're not just a foreigner, uh, you know, doing our own thing, not caring about what's happening. We do care. We are there. We, we're forming opinions on what we're seeing in the news. Um, and as a measurement consumer research company, we did quite a bit of work on looking at actually the changes in consumer behavior pre and post COVID at Nielsen. And one of these, one of the things that really stood out is amongst Asian Americans, everybody start, tuned in more. Actually, every, you know, um, in general, 26% more uh, Americans tuned into TV uh, when COVID hit and Asian Americans actually turned in even more at 38%. 38% uh, of viewership, uh, increase in viewership among Asian Americans. But even within that, we had more, a, a higher increase of news, right, uh, in March uh, versus the uh, non-Hispanic white. And that really it's all it speaks to also that Asian Americans, we are connected to Asia through Asian outlets, through uh, social media, we have family back there. And we were kind of, we were probably the first to really understand the severity of this pandemic. Um, so we actually see at Nielsen that Asian Americans were also the first to buy uh, masks, first to buy um, wipes, first to buy OTC uh, drugs, because we actually saw, uh, you know, under, we actually uh, saw the severity of it, of, of what was to come much earlier than the rest of the country. And so as a group that is very digitally connected, it's no surprise that we are also using these digital channels to get the news. So it's not just live TV, but uh, we're getting this news by streaming radio. We're getting the news through social media and podcasts as well. Um, and and uh, the other big area that we do cover in our report is Asian American and our ties into the gaming industry. Uh, gaming industry is huge. Uh, actually, 45 there was a 45% increase in people playing uh, video games uh, since we've, we've sheltered in place. And um, I see that every day when I talk, you know, every time I talk to my nep my 13 year old nephew. Um, but, but certainly it's a, it's a industry that is huge, $10 billion. I think that they reached it in, in just March of 20, uh, March, uh, this past March, which was the highest ever in digital gaming and Asian Americans have really high, big ties with that, right? We have ties as gamers. Uh, we, we tend to be more game, be, be, be gamers, but we're also young gamers. Um, we're also very, you know, included in the ecosystem because we are represented as the gaming influencers. Mark Iflyer is one of the biggest YouTube uh, gamers and um, he's a, 
a celebrity celebrity uh, status. Uh, then you have the esports, a spectator sports that is really going to grow, especially because of this uncertainty that we're seeing in the sports area where people are hungry for sports and who knows when we'll be able to go back into stadiums and um, uh, stadiums. So and so that's where we you know we saw we saw the increase of uh, with i racing and NASCAR. So uh, definitely some of these sports franchises will go digital. Uh, I suspect. But um, Asian Americans are still also very much part of the, the industry. They're, you know, top three out of top 10 um, uh, highest earners in esports are Asian Americans. So uh, uh, an industry that's very, that's growing rapidly, but very well represented by Asian Americans. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot that I included it. So yeah, so I, as I mentioned, they're young, they're well equipped, they have all the tools. My nephew says that virtual reality headsets is a must. Uh, and we're also e-specter sports. Oh, we're playing a lot of different uh, games and uh, different types of game, whether it's on the phone or a console. Um, and then, you know, it shows that these are some of these games are being developed. A lot of these games are being developed in Asia. So uh, there goes yet goes another tie because uh, you know as as sort of the bridge between the east and the west, uh, we know we know what's coming. We know what is being being played and popular in Asia. And so uh, at the last part of the report really is about how do you reach Asian Americans, right? So we know that there's potential. We know that there's uh, opportunity for marketers uh, to, to really tap into this consumer group. And really, um, it's in the approach. You have to start off by really understanding the Asian American community. Um, and there's a lot of resources. Uh, you'll hear from, from Bill Amata, who does who runs uh, an agency that specializes in Asian American, but there's a lot of resources and it, you really, really have to know uh, know a lot about the community, what the Asian diaspora looks like, what is it that is important to our to to our values um, as a community, and then you layer on the data, right? You layer on what it is that we like, which brands are we buying, what stores are we going to, and then you come up with your marketing sort of uh, messaging, and then decide on which platform to actually deliver that, right? Um, and there, this is where we're we're starting to really see some really impactful new platforms for marketers that really didn't exist uh, uh, you know, until recently. You have social media influencers. There's a lot of amazing Asian American social media influencers that big brands are tapping into. Your Sephora's of the world, your PNG's of the world, uh, Gucci, right? Uh, Calvin Klein, they're all tapping into these social influencers because they're really good at their craft and they've, been, they've developed this huge fan base that's really, really engaged. Um, there's also digital platforms that is really that's really targeted to um, authentic narratives. Um, the juggernaut is an example where it specializes in South Asian narratives and stories. Uh, Next Shark is is another one. These are these are great places to actually tap into uh, Asian Americans. We already talked about TV um, and then events, right? There's so many places, so many passion points that we have. Uh, and even it might not be the same as in the past where it's like, you know, a, a convention center, it might, you know, KCON had taking place in a convention center and a lot of the film festival had to be canceled this month, but it'll come back. And even if it comes back, you know, it could be come in a digital form. But the idea is that this is, these are passion points that really bring the community together. And then there's, you know, if whether again that you want to think about if is it in language or English and how that's going to help you support you to deliver your message. And there's a lot of really good um, uh, in language media outlets. And that too is very, very varied in terms of platforms. Uh, you know, historically, a lot of these in language media platforms were, uh, you know, newspapers, local newspapers, and now they have a digital arm. They're on social media. They have have uh, podcasts. Uh, same with TV, local TV stations. So definitely an area that has a lot of opportunity and really, really impactful for certain uh, for certain type of uh, messaging because the in language outlets are the ones who do have the trust of the Asian community. 
And, um, and so really to, to end it, uh, you know, we as a community, we're really in a place where uh, it's exciting. It's, a, it's for me personally, it's an exciting time to be Asian American, uh, just because uh, where we are today. And I think a, a quick hist uh, grant at where we've been uh, in the media really showcases where we, uh, you know, the importance of where we are today. Uh, because for so long, Asian Americans uh, were invisible really you know you had a friend group and like there was no asian uh face in within a friend group right um but but and, but and when we were on screen we were very much just the face that was playing uh, somebody else's narrative and um you know we were weird or we were you know a martial artist uh growing up everybody always asked me if my brother did martial arts um and so that it was very stereotypical and it was really at the turn of the century that changed everything right um because we were starting to see more, uh, you know, we, Harold and Kumar, I think is a great example where all of a sudden Asian Americans are actually funny, right? And we do things like everybody else, ta-da! Um, but also the digital, the digital platform changed everything. We have um, all these amazing Asian Americans who were, who really perfected their craft of storytelling through video. Uh, and so you have people like Lily Singh and Aquafina, they ended up in Hollywood uh, because of uh, their success through YouTube, because of the, being able to tell their stories, inviting America into their, into their house uh, and, and learning about their culture and their, um, their heritage. But while all of that is happening in front of the camera, we also had a lot of Asian Americans behind uh, social media platforms that have become mainstream for uh, mainstream in this country um, and so really the digital uh, the, the, the uh, you know the digital has been the new frontier for Asian Americans and I really wanted to just sort of end with a quick uh, quick uh, video of, uh, of our our uh, engagement in the community today so let me see hopefully I can do it fingers crossed here we go. It's great. Um, thank you. If anything, if I fall upon hard times, we can sell this. So that's good. Um, what's up, Soul Cycle White Harlem? Uh... <laughs> But you know, as I as I had mentioned before, um, you know, I hope that with that with that video, you get to sort of see a glimpse of understand why it is such a great m moment for our community, and really why I'm so excited to see what's ahead. Uh, so really, just some key takeaways to all of you marketers out there thinking about um, the Asian American consumer. Uh, it really is uh, we are a group that's going to drive growth. 
right? Um, so again, you know, uh, with all, all, not with the population growth comes this sphere of influence that we have on all aspects of our culture, you know, and, and, and our uh, digital sort of connectivity is really um, uh, noteworthy in that we are actually the pace setters when it comes to early adoptions of digital services uh, and also just sort of voting with our, our wallet and our voice when it comes to content. Um, and, and this rise in Asian American consciousness really has given us this exciting opportunity where you can actually tap into this Asian American market through a lot of these new outlets that actually did not exist in the past. So um, with that, uh, that we do all the things that I did share with you today is available in our report on Nielsen.com and it's download for it's free. So uh, I hope that you'll use this as a as a tool and resource for uh, for your planning uh, for your marketing plan. So thank you so much for for my time and I think I'm going to give it back to uh, Marina, or, or maybe it's Bill. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to give it to Bill, actually. So, okay. Bill, you want to share your screen? Okay. And I just want to remind everyone, keep putting your questions in the Q&A. And after Bill's presentation, we're going to open it up and have um, questions and maybe a conversation. Well, that was great, uh, Mariko. And thank you so much, uh, Austin, Chamber of Commerce, Asian Chamber of Commerce. Actually, I'm really excited about speaking to Austin because... Uh, Frankly, Austin is uh, one of the fastest growing Asian and Pacific Islander populations in the country, and Texas is in the top four. So uh, you've actually grown quite significantly in a very short period of time. And if you look at the different counties that are surrounding uh, the Austin area, you're talking Travis, Williams, um, a few others, I think Hayes and Caldwell are also part of your area. And yes. we've gone, you know, from 100,000 to 130,000 to 165,000. And I would estimate that the Asian population in greater Austin is actually at 200,000 and will soon touch a quarter of a million people in a very short period of time. And if you look at Texas overall, there's over 1.5 million Asian Americans in Texas. That's gonna grow to 2.4 million by 2030 and a whopping 6 million, 6 million Asian Americans will be in Texas probably by the year 2050. So if you are a company that is in the Austin, the greater Austin area now, uh, you might want to start thinking about getting involved in the chamber. Uh, and if you're a small business here, uh, I actually think that there's tremendous opportunities for you to use some of the data that you just heard from Nielsen to sell your companies to the vast number of uh, businesses that are already in the Round Rock area. And I just have to say, the Round Rock Chamber of Commerce was at my office not too long ago, trying to convince me to move to Austin because you're taking all the way the California company. So shame on you. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I did wanna walk, uh, show you a little bit uh, about how to use some of this data. And uh, the reason why I'm using McDonald's is because there is a member of your chamber who open, who has about I want to say 14 McDonald's in the greater Austin area and outside of Austin. Uh, and his name is Jimmy Ferguson. And so he would be very mad at me if I didn't use uh, McDonald's as, as a case study. So just uh, to walk you through some of this, um, I think uh, you already heard a lot from Mariko, but as you could remember, if, if some of you are around uh, back in uh, 1987, you know, we were looked at the Asian community was looked at the whiz kids, kind of this model minority people that you didn't want to have any Asians in your math class because you didn't want them to ruin the curve for you with your grades. But then fast forward to uh, 2018, 19, and 2000 and beyond, and we're actually show, uh, seeing that Asian Americans are not just behind the scenes, but actually in front of the camera. So I said in the last conversation that we had that Asians were always in the back, but now we're in the front. Companies were trying to look at other markets like the Latinx population, the African-American um, uh, markets as they should, uh, but now they're realizing if they're gonna make inter, inter um, if they're gonna grow uh, their share in places like Texas, then they have to think about the uh, Asian-American markets. Uh, in Texas and specifically in Austin. Uh, and the same with uh, influence. We're not just uh, taking influence from others. We are now actually the influencers. So 
so if you look at, uh, similar to what Mariko said, we're actually influencing the um, consumer market in many, many different ways. So Mariko was talking a little bit about some of the social media, but one of the social media outlets that I want to mention is Yelp. We actually over-index in the use of Yelp by three digits, two, three, four hundred percent. Uh, so you probably have friends that uh, go to restaurants, and if you're non-Asian, you probably freak out a little bit about this. But when you go with your friend to an Asian restaurant, uh, what is the first thing we do if we love this, the food that we like? We grab our mobile device and we take a picture of it. Uh, and so we are the population that actually got that craze going, taking pictures of food. Uh, and so part of the reason why platforms like Yelp do so well is because um, Asian Americans have an opportunity to express themselves on Yelp when they may not be able to express themselves in other platforms. But now we're actually changing the narrative around specific things like food, art, and entertainment, as Mariko said. So um, McDonald's was paying attention to this and they said, okay, well, what are some of the things that uh, McDonald's uh, needs to pay attention to? Well, you know, these were some of the people that actually set the narrative, uh, set the narrative for the community. Um, but they're also, we're also setting trends. So I know uh, we have a very large Chinese, Indian, and Vietnamese population in Austin and a growing Filipino population. Well, a lot of these trends that are coming from Asia are actually being brought to places like Texas and are actually changing the landscape of how uh, we view food and music, arts, and entertainment. So McDonald's paid very close, closely to this trend and how Asian trends have influenced American popular culture. So we had to start rethinking how to look at Asian Americans as consumers they're, because they're not only uh, people that consume, they're also setting trends and setting trends not only for Asians, but also for non-Hispanic whites, Latinos, African Americans and other cultures. And so usually when companies want to start, and it might be the city of Austin, if you want to get involved in in, in learning about the Asian American community. Usually the first place you start is you join the Greater Austin Asian American Chamber, or you might look at Asian Lunar New Year, like Chinese New Year, or you might think about Diwali, or you might think of Tet, uh, which is a, a Vietnamese New Year, and you might think of getting involved. So many, many years ago, McDonald's wanted to get involved. So where did they start? They did exactly that. They looked at the things that were important to culture, our, our holidays, our events, our dinners, and our galas. And uh, McDonald's decided that we need to celebrate some of these things in each of these communities because they're not just Asian holidays, they're also holidays that are important to Texans and to people from Austin. And then we looked even further and said, well, now that we've been involved in events, then we have to make some investment in the community. So McDonald's started to advertise not just in English, but also in other languages. So if you're in a place like Austin, you know that you have a very large Indian population that not only speaks Hindi, they may also speak other languages like Punjabi or Gujarati, or they might be from Pakistan and speak Urdu. Uh, but you also have a large Vietnamese and growing Chinese population that speaks Mandarin uh, uh, or Korean or Vietnamese. So in order to make themselves feel a little bit more connected to the community. Uh, they wanted to do things not only in English, but also do things in the language. And for the uh, English dominant folks, which uh, is a growing population in Texas, uh, there had to be commercials that appealed to Asian Americans. You just can't put Asians in an ad and say this works. You've got to put Asians in real situations. So here's just one example of a really quick ad that McDonald's did very early on. And you might recognize somebody in this ad. And I hope it works. Maybe it's not working for me. Can you guys? Oh, there it goes. We can't hear her sing. And if you didn't recognize her, that's Constance Wu, who's in Crazy Rich Asians, but also in Fresh Off the Boat, 
uh, which is an ABC production. Uh, but we also looked at the evolution of the Asian American consumers. And if we look back, these are some very important influencers uh, uh, who remain influential, uh, but started off very early. So to the very far right is Michelle Pham. She became a YouTube celebrity many, many years ago. And she now has a cosmetic company in his probably worth well over a billion dollars. So these people were early, early influencers of Asian American culture, and they were uniquely American. So McDonald's looked at these influencers and said, we need to follow not only their careers, but also look at the future of influencers. So in order to do that, rather than kind of go to people that are already uh, engage. We looked at some new approaches and some new influencers. We work with different production companies like Wong Fu Production and the Fung, Fung Brothers, and we kind of played around with some of the McDonald products because, you know, these are old products. We have to give it a fresh look. And, uh, and frankly, Chicken McNuggets is not always that appealing to people. But we decided to have a lot of fun with Chicken McNuggets. And so uh, the Fung Brothers did a really great um, campaign where they are testing all the different sauces that you could use uh, with chicken McNuggets and included a lot of different types of Asian sauces that were popular in India, that were popular in China, that were popular in Korea, and popular right here in the United States. And we, we had a little bit of fun with that. And then we started to look at the power of KCON. And so uh, Mariko talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, when I started the agency, the popular people were Maria, uh, Mar uh, Mariah Carey, uh, and then it moved on to people like uh, Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears, and then it moved on to other people um, such as um, Taylor Swift. Uh, and then you move even forward now, and then you see the impact that Asian uh, bands are having. So uh, groups like BTS uh, became very, very popular and started to take uh, not only Korea and China and Japan by storm, uh, but Americans here included African Americans, Latino Americans, non-Hispanic whites and other Asians. And KCON became a huge phenomenon that McDonald's wanted to play a role in that and participate in, in a lot of these productions. Uh, and then we looked at things like red envelopes, you know, a, a Chinese Lunar New Year or Tet. Uh, we have this tradition of giving these envelopes usually to unmarried uh, people in our family, and a lot of those envelopes look the same. So we decided to take a iconic uh, Asian American designer, fashion designer, Anna Sui, and then she created these special uh, McDonald's red envelopes, which you put usually put a little money in, or you might put something else, in, and you give them away to your to your relatives. So we wanted to give it a little fresh look and a little modern look for the year of the dog, and this is just an example. Uh, and here's. Uh, I'm not going to play this because we don't have a lot of time, but this is a little video that talks about Anna Sui's engagement with McDonald's and the importance of staying true to American roots as well as cultural roots. Um, and then we looked at other ways to engage. So uh, this was an event, an activation. We have had some interactive things where you could actually get these uh, red envelopes, but you could also find out a little bit about different foods and snacks. Uh, and then something that uh, also was interesting, uh, as Mariko was saying, that there's this real interest in, in music and in culture and entertainment. And so the, our New York team said, well, why don't we do this morning rave party? And when I first heard this, I went, a morning rave party? Are you guys crazy? And they said, yeah, we get this really famous DJ, uh, Killa Manila, and we're going to promote these breakfast sandwiches. And I said, well, so when is this rave party going to start? And they said, Bill's going to start at six o'clock. And I said, nobody is going to wake up at six o'clock, uh, especially millennials. Um, they're probably going to be in bed until eight or nine. And they said, Bill, you're wrong. Now, um, Asian uh, DJs, Asian music, Asian ideas and thoughts are actually very per pervasive across culture. And so they came up with this campaign. And it started at six. They got this very famous DJ. Uh, and at four o'clock in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, there was a line around the block. But in order to demonstrate to McDonald's that this would be popular, um, they, they said, hey, go to a McDonald's, pick up a breakfast sandwich, bring this receipt with you, uh, and we're going to let you into this rave party. Uh, and it not only attracted the attention of Asian media, it got the attention of mass market media as well. 
So just a quick video. Oops, sorry. Oh. So, so I know all of you guys are, are like saying, okay, well, how does this apply to Austin? Well, it's, it's, it's clear to me, University of Texas, Austin, 18, 19% of the student body is Asian American. Concordia, 3%. Austin Community College, 5%. There's a large and growing young population, even though the Austin demographics has kind of tilted a little up. Um, Asian Americans, Latinx folks, African Americans tend to skew younger. So if you're going to get involved in the market, get involved in the market with young people, get them engaged, and they're going to be your brand ambassador for life. And so we also had to make sure that they connected with music. So if you look at Amber Liu, Amber Liu is a KCON celebrity, and right next to her is Mike Bao, who's a, a YouTube celeb. And so we said, well, if we're going to make McDonald's, which is, uh, you know, sometimes viewed as grandma's brand, we had to make sure that it was relevant to younger people. So here's an example. Hey, Bill, I think we can't hear the sound when you're playing. Oh, you videos. can't. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't hear it. I'm sorry. So anyway, but, but you can still see the, the video, right? Yeah. If you unplug your headset, you, you might be able to hear. Oh, I'm going to try to do that. Let's see. Does it work? So, so those are just some examples, and you can see how quickly this uh, went viral, not just on Asian media sites and social media sites, uh, but also on mass market sites. So this just gives you an idea that if you want to be relevant to consumers, you've got to make it relevant for them with the genres of music, entertainment, and the way they communicate, uh, and that social engagement is critically important. Um, and that's basically it for my presentation. Um, what I wanted to do next time uh, we get together, I'm hoping that we can, I can talk to you a little bit about how to survive in COVID-19, um, because if you're a small business and you're with the Austin Asian Chamber, I wanna make sure that you look at all the different ways that you can talk about um, your company and your growth and what you can be, how you can be a part of the greater Austin community. So uh, I'm hoping we have a few questions.
Uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions for Mariko, but we'll do our best to answer some questions for you while we still have you on your online. So thank you so much uh, for being uh, with us. I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Bill. And also, um, Mariko, we, uh, we do have a couple good questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to read the questions. So one question is, what is the most effective way to engage with this uh, APA demographic for contract opportunities in the public sector? So I think this is a good question. Um, it's more, um, you know, if prime contractor is looking for a subcontractor. So uh, what are the tips for them to reach out to the APA demographic, um, this specific, this group? Um, I, I think I could take that because uh, um, actually I don't like the term subcontractor. So one of the things that I want to encourage all of the small business owners out there that would like to, you know, work for these companies, because you have a lot of great companies. Coros is there. EA is there. You got Dell there. You've got Cision, uh, Adobe. Uh, I think State Farm has a major presence there. So one thing that you might want to do is make sure that you are actively engaged uh, in, in some of the conferences that are held. So if, you know, the city of Austin or the county of Travis or a lot of these companies like EA and Adobe and State Farm, they often have these bidder conferences. You want to make sure that you go to those bidders conferences and be seen. Um, and, and I also have to tell you that uh, you want to get on any of the um, servers or, or the services that list all the potential contracts that are coming from the county and the city and from the companies, you want to get on those lists. And I'm pretty sure the chamber can help you get on those lists. And you want to take a real close look at those. And then you want to see who the contractors are, the, um, the prime contracts are, and you want to reach out and, and chat with them. Uh, and, and by the way, if those contractors say no to you for the first time, please, please do not give up. Uh, because no to me means maybe. Uh, you just have to continue to always be in front of them. Uh, and, and, and I know people are always going to tell you do elevator speeches. I don't believe in elevator speeches uh, because my comment to that is, what do you do when you get to your floor? Uh, so instead, I, I think the best way to have a conversation with a prime contractor is to know something about them, uh, find out what their pain points are. Uh, and, and have a conversation like that. So whenever I start a conversation, I always I say, you know, I really like the things that you've been doing uh, with EA or the great work that you're doing for the city of Austin. Um, tell me uh, a little bit about how you were able to get into the city of Austin. And that person is going to love it because you just turn the floor over to them and they could talk about themselves. And then you find a way to plug in to that conversation. Uh, and, and that's the best way, I think, uh, for you to get in. But you want to build those relationships first. Uh, and I also want to just mention really quickly, don't wait to be asked. Um, if you see an opportunity to work with a prime contractor, uh, jump in and say, you know, I have an idea. I have a suggestion. Um, and, and I'll tell you a lot of the uh, small business people say, Bill, I'm, I don't want to give away an idea. And I said, believe me, your idea 20, 30, 40, 50 other thousand people have come up with that idea. It's okay to give away an idea. Um, and because I will tell you if, you, if you help somebody out, I think that person is going to remember and they're going to remember to work with you and also stay close to your competitors because your competitors might not be able to do something. They may pass it on to you. Thank you. I have, I have a quick follow-up to that. I think the question really was from the city side. Oh, how, sorry. Do we, how do we encourage um, the Asian American businesses, like what's the right messaging to encourage them to actually want to bid for contracts? So it's really an issue that frankly, even the chamber, we have, um, we have a little bit of a problem, which frankly, maybe the economic situation might change. The economy was just doing so well, I think, where Asian American businesses did not have to look at government contracts as an opportunity. Now, with, with, the, with our economy not doing so well, I think they will be more open to that. But if we were good to go out to Asian businesses and encourage them to do business with the city, for example, do you have any tips on how we message that? Well, the best way to do that is to show off the people that are successful uh, and, and ask those successful people to talk about what they did to get into working with the city of Austin or the county of Travis. Uh, when people see 
that the steps are, uh, when, when people see and experience those steps, it's so much easier to do because I think a lot of people say, oh, I'm never gonna be able to work for the city of Austin. I don't know anybody at the city of Austin. They don't know me. Uh, but when the successful people uh, and, and many successful people are willing to do this, walk people through the steps and show people that uh, uh, that's the important thing. But I also think that a lot of small business people and, and maybe the city of Austin, um, uh, we need to encourage people that the best way to get from point A to point B isn't always a straight line. And there might be multiple ways to get into the city of Austin. And that's by going to networking events, uh, talking to you, Marina, and your team, uh, visiting, uh, you know, city council people, uh, and just participating in conversations and being present. And I know that's not easy, but a lot of times people give up way too easily. So I always tell people, even if you don't get through the front door, try the back door, try a side door. Uh, always make yourself visible. And the same should be for the city of Austin. Uh, Austin, don't give up. Uh, and I think that sometimes, you know, uh, we have this attitude where we walk into a neighborhood and say, oh, no, the Asian people want to work with us. Well, you gave up too easily. Uh, when people see you over and over and over again, they're gonna realize that you are there because you really care about wanting them to be a part of uh, the city. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately people go to, uh, you know, one of the Chinese Lunar New Year events or to Diwali event and go, oh my God, there are a lot of Indian Chinese people, nobody wants to talk to me. And then they give up. Um, you gotta keep going back and back and back and back. And I think business people give up too easily too. They fall once and then they don't wanna go back. Uh, I say, if you fall, pick yourself up, try again. If you fail, go back, pick yourself, go back again. And Austin, do that. The city of Austin, keep coming back and saying, I want to be, I want you to be part of our community. I want you to consider being involved in bids and contracts. Um, let us help you get there um, and, and show people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, the next questions here I have is uh, more specifically in um, HR and recruiters. So uh, what, are, what are the tips that you can give it to our audience on how can they create a marketing message when they wanna try to hire um, Asian workers um, and specifically engage with this, our Asian uh, community, this group? I think Mariko, you can all help on this as well because uh, you know there's employee resource groups and business resource groups. Nielsen has them. Uh, our organization also has them, and I often look for allies. Uh, and so you have a lot of companies that either have a branch here or a headquarters here, and many of them have employee resource groups that are Asian American, Latinx, African American, LGBTQ plus women, uh, vets. Uh, and, and those are often the people I go to. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think is really important if you're an HR person is you've got to be able to ask the three magic words, I need help. Uh, and I will tell you, um, any HR person, anybody in corporate America, any small business person or any community leader in Austin, if you walk up to them and say, Marina, I need help. I want to try to reach more um, students, or I want to try to reach more business people, and you have that ability to reach those people. Can you help me? Uh, and nobody's going to say no to you. Uh, uh, and so if we're able to say that, you're going to get a lot more help. And I'll tell you, these companies with these employee resource groups, those resource groups are there for a reason, to be a resource, not only to the people internally, but the people externally. So just say, I need help. That, that's a really good answer. Um, uh, um, I guess the next question is, a lot of people are wondering, like, should we have a balance between marketing to uh, Asian Americans, uh, people of color, without excluding the Caucasian population? Rico, you can jump in at any of these conversations anytime <laughs> no, you want to. No, I love hearing. I always learn from Bill, so I'm always, uh, I'm always all ears. But um, can you can you just repeat? I couldn't hear the first part of that question. Oh yeah, sure. So um, people are wondering that when they do a marketing, you know, message to the the our Asian uh, market, should should we have have a balance between marketing to Asian Americans, so people of color, without excluding Caucasian populations? 
Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think the approach is like, uh, it's, is uh, what we're seeing is that even Americans, right? The, the ones who are not, not from color communities of color are also gravitating towards brands that are marketing, uh, and being inclusive. Right. So um, it's, you know, by by going and being very culturally fluent for a uh, for a, a community of color, you're actually raising your overall general general um, brand equity, really, because uh, it's really the Americans who are, who, who the, you know, the non non, uh, you know, Caucasian, Caucasian Americans are the ones who are also looking for that diversity and they want to support companies who are inclusive. I have to say, we need Caucasians. Yeah. Our community needs Caucasians. Uh, Caucasians, Latinx folks, African-American folks, you're part of a bigger picture. And, and frankly, Asian Americans, um, Asian American marketing, it would not survive without the help of white people. Uh, and uh, or it won't help without the support of African Americans and Latinx folks. And I think that's one thing that Asian Americans have to learn if they don't know this already is that uh, we are succeeding off the backs of Caucasians, Latinx folks and African American folks. And I will tell you that in marketing, um, we take into consideration everything that comes through. So just real quick, one of the mantras that I have in our agency is from a, an Italian American and her name was Catherine Barchetti. And one of her, her quotes is make a customer, not a sale. That is a Caucasian American person that has really influenced the way we market to Asians, African Americans, Booker T. Washington and said, if you want to lift up yourself, lift up someone else. And then Latinos, they say, donde comen cinco comen seis. If you can feed six, you can feed, if you could feed five, you could feed six. If you could feed seven, you could feed eight at your table. And that to me says that every idea that comes to your table is something you should value. And so we need Caucasians. We need other Asian Americans. We need Latinx. We need people from the Middle East. We need young people. We need older people. It takes a lot to market to any community and the combined wisdom of everyone is going to make a difference in how we reach our, cons our consumer. Thank you so much. Um, Marina, do you want to add more questions? Well, there, there are a couple. Um, I think L Loda had a quick question on streaming. Um, I think, Mariko, you had mentioned in your presentation how we use at least one streaming device. And I think she was mentioning that. Um, and, but her question was, um, Asians are using at least one streaming, which is showing maybe what's trending. What's trending to Americans is the question, actually. You're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, so really, this move towards streaming is happening for everyone. Um, it's just that I think Asian Americans are the ones who are leading that trend. Uh, so we have 82% who have at least one streaming device, uh, one streaming service, but the total population is only 72, but they'll get there. It, it, you know, we were the first ones to be, you know, to be on, um, on the, you know, you, a, a lot of more activity on apps and, and phone, and then everybody sort of follows. So uh, it, it's a trend that's happening across. It's just that we, we're, we're leading it, leading the pack. Perfect. And I think, I'm not sure if this question you all can answer, but one of our members, she's interested in um, how do you get on Netflix or Amazon? How do, you, how do you get a show on those streaming platforms? Like what, do you all know what that process is? <laughs> um, I know a little bit. Uh, so it certainly helps if you, uh, if you have an ally. Uh, and so um, one thing that is good to know is if you see different Netflix shows or if you see things that are streaming or being uh, commented on on Twitter or Instagram video, or if you see a celebrity that you particularly like, it's often great to comment. Um, and I also believe in stalking. <laughs> Uh, and so one of the things that I do want to recommend that is, and uh, in, in, you know, I, I hated accounting, by the way. So if there's any business majors in there, sorry, but I hate accounting. Uh, but I did learn one thing about accounting that I'll never forget. And that's, um, I, I learned about 
LIFO, which is last in, first out. And I was always one of those people. I would go to a networking event. Like if Marina was having a, a greater Austin Asian chamber, started at six, I would show up at 6.30. Uh, and I would wave at Marina. And as soon as, I, as she turned her back, I would be the first one out. Uh, and I realized that we have to practice philo, which is be the first one in and the last one out. So if you find out about an Austin Chamber event, in, it starts at six, be there at 5.30. Uh, and I will stalk the Netflix people. Uh, by the way, Netflix is a client. Um, and and, and uh, I will go to events and receptions and, and I will make sure that I, they see me. Um, I won't have my elevator speech, but I'll say, you know, I really like the half of it or I really liked uh, um, Wu Assassins, or I really like Ugly Delicious. And, but I have an idea that might actually make um, what you're doing better. Um, may I share that idea with you? And I think it's exciting because we also now have more Asians uh, who are making some of those decisions, right? You just heard about Stephen Young. He signed on with Amazon, right, to uh, do a lot of their production. So. Uh, as we get more Asians in sort of the ones who are making those decisions on what projects get, 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 um, uh, you know, pulled, uh, get, get, get greenlit. So I think it will help us with our, with our community as well. And, and, and I will also tell you that it's more than just storytelling these days, it's story living. Uh, each of you in the audience, including every member of the chamber has a story. Um, bring that story to life, um, uh, write a book, uh, talk about it online, like a, on YouTube, uh, post it on Facebook or Instagram stories uh, and let people know that that story exists. And, and believe me, if they love that story, somebody's gonna pick it up uh, on Netflix or a Hulu or a Disney Plus. So always be prepared to tell your story uh, mm -hmm. because that how, that's how it gets picked up. And I think, you know, in that, in, in, on that note, I think, uh, you know, ha we actually have sort of not an advantage, but we have stories, right, um, which that people are interested in. Um, I was talking to one of the founders who founded Dang, Dang Chips. They, they create those coconut chips that you see at Whole Foods. Um, and he, they started their tie. Their, their Dang is the mo their mom's name. And they did it. They started when they started marketing in this healthy snack area. They actually didn't at all lean into their Thai heritage. Um, and but they would go to these trade shows and all people will come over and all they would be really interested in their story, their brothers, that they was their mom. They had, you know, it was the mom, the mom who gave them uh, who actually made these coconut chips for them. And so then they decided. And so now they actually put that story in the packaging and they added their Thai, their Thai sort of heritage uh, into the packaging so that they can share that story. So I think that is one of the things that uh, we're at a moment where people are gravitating towards, the, you know, authentic, authentic stories, because I think that's how we relate the most uh, is, is through, is through our, our human stories. Mariko, I'm, I love that answer. I think our community especially we're like shy about telling the story mm -hmm. part or they, or we minimize it like, Oh, nobody's going to care. Or, this is what everybody like, because the story is our story. We don't think it's special. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um so we have one more question. I think this will um, be our last question and it will it'll take us to the end of our time together. But this um, is from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, what is a tactful way of asking an ally for help? Basically what you're asking is, how can I get my message out to more people like you? But what is, you know, how, how to do that tactfully if you're not Asian? Mm. I think that was more directed to Bill because you, you said, go ask for help. For help, right. Mm. Um, so if you are not Asian and ask for help, is that what the question is? Yeah. Um, I prefer to be asked directly uh, but, uh, but not everybody does. And I, and I think that there are times to do that. Um, and, and I will tell you that uh, I look for opportunities in, in, in good times and bad. And I think sometimes we only want to focus on the good times. But I also think that, uh, you know, every person, every company, every brand goes through a life cycle. Uh, and you want to be one of those people that is there in good times 
and they're in not so good time. So, so often if I hear that some, um, that there's an issue or a challenge that a person is having, then, then I'll jump in. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, somebody I really, really wanted to meet uh, had this little wall around her for, for, for quite some time. And every time I tried to talk to her, uh, I got, I, I just didn't have the guts because uh, I'm, I'm introverted in a lot of ways. But then one day I overheard her having a conversation about her daughter having a peanut allergy. Uh, and she was a little far away. Um, and I noticed a complete change in this person's demeanor. This is going to sound crazy because I always say do things directly, but this is kind of indirect. And uh, she was very troubled about, you know, her, her, her daughter almost dying of a peanut allergy. Uh, and, 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 and she became a mom. And to me, she became a person at that point. And I just made a mental note of this. Fast forward, talking to a person from Whole Foods, uh, and she told me that her son almost died uh, ingesting peanuts um, uh, on an airplane. And, and you probably know the airline that used to give away peanuts. And I said, what did you do? And she goes, now I cook every meal for my son and I have a recipe book. And I said, wait a minute, uh, can you do me a favor and pick up the phone and call this executive at this company? And she said, why? And I said, because she'll probably want to know about this. And she said, yeah, give me her number. I gave her the number and she picked up the phone and called this executive and said, I heard that your daughter has a peanut allergy. I have a recipe book I'd like to share with you. 45 minute conversation. And she said, who told you my daughter had a peanut allergy? Bill Amata. And she, and she said, why would Bill Amata have you call me? And she said, because he cares. Uh, and a few days later, I get a phone call from that person saying, um, that was so kind of you to do that. Um, I don't know what I need to do, but you're going to be working for our company. Uh, so, I, so, so even if you don't have uh, um, the nerve to say, I need help, uh, there's a lot of different ways to connect with that person. And I say, try to find the human way to connect with that person. Uh, and sometimes it's a, a, at a difficult time like COVID-19 um, when, you know, people are laying off their employees or their companies. And that might be the time to reach out and say, I'd like to help you. Uh, what can I do to help? Or, or how can I be of service to you? Uh, and it shouldn't be about making money. Uh, it should be about, uh, you know, really being empathetic and helpful and then take some action on it. And Bill, does it also mean that um, eavesdropping is okay? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, hey, if you're having a lot, 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 a lot enough conversation and you're overhearing it, I say absolutely. <laughs> as long as it's not like really private information, no. But I, but this was a conversation at an at an event, um, and, and uh, you know, and and you could hear all the people talking around you, and and that conversation just struck me. Um, because of the way the conversation changed from a business conversation to a very personal conversation. And I just want to mention, by the way, um, if these companies that in Austin are struggling, this is a really good time for you to reach out to them. Um, don't reach out to people just in good times and ask for, uh, for things. But if you see a company struggling, send a note. Uh, if you have something to offer, let people know that you're there to support them. Exactly what Catherine Barchetti said, make a customer, not a sale. Well, I can't think of um, a better line to like end our whole webinar. I can't believe we spent almost 90 minutes together. Um, I thought the information was amazing. It's always so, I think it's a reflection of how we're not um, in the limelight or we're not the, the topic of conversation. So when I'm around, you know, other Asian Americans and then we see ourselves in the media that you all shared, it was just really great. So thank you so much. Um, we have the, the webinar um, recorded. So participants, thanks for most of you stay till the very end. Um, if you have other questions later, feel free to reach out to Yishan or me and we'll be sharing the, the recording. So thanks everybody, really appreciate yeah. you. Thank Bill, you guys so much. Mariko. Yeah. Well, we'll have you again like in real life one of these days. Ooh, sounds good yeah. to me. Can't wait to go to Austin. And if you if you're really coming to Round Rock, you better let me know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what Round Rock was until that person came by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks yeah. everyone, and thanks thank to the Greater everyone. Asian Chamber and to all the sponsors, City of Austin. Yeah. Thank you. To all the sponsors and Marina, thank you and your team. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.